It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the films of October 27th, 2000. we got three movies to look at today, so let's go ahead and jump right on into it. We'll start off with the biggest new release of the weekend, and that is, of course, the infamous Book of Shadows, Blair Witch 2. Let that trailer be a perfect example of the really horrible way they sold this movie. Um, you know how the first movie did a good job of making you believe it was actually a real story that happened and not something that was actually made by as a, as a scripted storyline? Yeah, they didn't do a good job of handling it this time around. It felt like this was something that was being rushed out almost immediately after it came out. No thought was being put into this whatsoever. And um, you could tell because... The basic plot of this is that you have a group of people fascinated by the mythology surrounded by the Blair Witch Project. They go into the Black Hills where the original film was shot and experience supernatural phenomenon and psychological unraveling. That's what the plot tells you, but the Blair Witch is barely mentioned in the story, in the story except in things that are obviously altered in post-production. Like, this is a film that was notoriously cut down from what it is i'm fully convinced that this movie was originally supposed to be its own movie i mean i mean they sold this movie as a psychological thriller and a meditation on mass hysteria but it was significantly altered in post-production and the director joe burlinger would later claim compromise his original vision and among the changes were a new soundtrack additional editing the integration of entirely new sequences that make no sense it also doesn't help that you have a lot of actors in here that did go on to become actors in their own rights. Of course, Jeffrey Donovan went out to star in Burn Notice and Law and & Order. Kim Director, somebody you might be familiar with, as well as Erica Leershin. Um Yeah, they did not do a good job at all selling this movie as anything but as anything but nothing but a cash grab of the original movie, of the original Blair Witch Project, which the first trailer alone... I mean, the first few minutes alone in this movie where everyone's talking about the Blair Witch Project. You have all these different talk shows, all these different shows and movie reviews talking about the Blair Witch Project and all that stuff. Like, right from the get-go, it's completely lost on what this movie was trying to do, accomplish. All this movie did when it was all said and done was pretty much basically just try to make a quick back buck off the original film like you could say like the, there was a, the Blair Witch sequel that came out not too long ago in 2016 it wasn't a great movie overall but it at least was trying to do something different with the original Blair Witch pro Project and, and try to make us forget about this horrible abomination which I guess it succeeded maybe not all the way through but at least did better than I think most people would have would have expected to do like it was an actual sequel that was actually trying to do something but this this movie really just fell apart right from the get-go. It was nothing but a straight-up cash grab. Nothing of significance happened in the film. Nothing about the movie makes any sense. The characters are really poorly written. The storyline makes no sense whatsoever. Like, nothing about this movie makes no sense. And it fell apart so quickly. And whatever franchise they were trying to set up here, that was long gone after this movie came out. And, um... Yeah, this is a mess. This is an abomination of a film. Like, so many different levels. It's just a complete missed, missed opportunity on so many different levels. And, you know, like, at least they kind of tried to bring it back with the Blair, with the, the Blair Witch movie Adam Winger did. But, I mean, it didn't work all the way through. But at least it was trying on, like, this abomination, which literally, prob which I'm willing to bet you was an original co concept, but it was eventually put, they eventually put, did it in post-production where they made it the Blair Witch sequel, which it really, really did not have a whole lot to do with the Blair Witch Project, what is except just mentioning the Blair Witch Project, but nothing in the major storyline that was going on. It's just, it's not a good movie. Bottom line, it's a terrible movie. It's one of the worst horror movies ever made. Not just one of the worst sequels ever made. One of the worst horror movies ever made, Period. Plain and simple, so. Uh, let's see if we can turn the tide around with our next movie, which is The Little Vampire. He was always afraid of vampires. 
fires. You have another nightmare? Until the night, he met one. I saw you in my dream. That's right. This Halloween, vampires can be friends. Hi, my name's Bob. Kids can be heroes. Tony! Thanks, dude. You saved my life, my hero. And cows can yeah. fly. Yes! <laughs> the Little Vampire, rated PG, starts Friday, October 27th. Eh, not really. Uh, you have Jonathan Lipnicki from Stuart Little, who is this boy who's trying to save a young vampire and his family from a ruthless vampire hunter. And uh, you can kind of tell that it's your kind of typical kid, 2000s kids movie. Um, not necessarily a great movie, but not a, it's not necessarily a bad movie, but certainly not a great movie either. And I guess that's probably the best way to really subscribe, describe the movie in general, because... You kind of expect a lot worse compared to that trailer I just showed you, but when you watch the movie overall, it's not that it's bad. It just doesn't really have that little spark that it really needs to really make something unique and stand out about this. And Jonathan Lipnicki in here kind of going through the Mara Wilson syndrome where they just put her in movies after Matilda and Mrs. Doubtfire and Miracle on 34th Street and hope that it's going to become a big success. I guess you could say the same thing about Macaulay Culkin too because in the early 90s, but... um. Yeah, after this, Nikki kind of fell off the map, honestly. I mean, he kind of just went on a... He just kind of left the Hollywood scene and uh, didn't really do anything in particular except for Stuart Little 2. But even after that, it's just kind of like... I guess they were trying to set him up for a movie like this to be the next big thing, and it just... It just didn't work all the way through. I mean, it has some interesting ideas to it. It's not bad, per se... It's a kid's movie. I mean, it's nothing too spectacular. It's nothing bad either. I mean, I was expecting a whole lot worse just by that trailer alone, but I guess it's not that bad. So I guess I have to give it that. I mean, it's, I mean, for one time watch for kids, I think it's fine. But other than that, though, I see no reason why your kid would want to watch this over and over again. So, uh, yeah, with that said, let's move on to our last movie we have here, and that is John Travolta and Lisa Kudrow in Lucky Numbers. Weatherman. We love your show. You have a good day. Community man. How old are you, 27? Five. Lucky man. We're going to be millionaires. Now everyone wants a piece of rust. I want half the money. 20%. From the director of You've Got Mail, John Travolta, Lisa Kudrow. You have got to stop buying things from Italy. Lucky numbers. If it wasn't on a boat, I don't want it. Rated it on. Friday, October 27th in theaters everywhere. So as you see in the trailer, John Travolta plays this weatherman. He's very popular in uh, western Pennsylvania, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. He's so popular that he owns a snowmobile dealership. Uh, he's a very popular weatherman, and he has his own table at the local Denny's. But uh, things start to go awry for him, and he basically ends up having to pay, pay, having to have a lot of debt to his credit and having to deal with these negative repercussions. So he basically gets together with these other people in an attempt to scam the lottery of, of and plan to win the next jackpot worth $6.4 million. But even that plan uh, goes off the haywire pretty quickly. Uh, this was actually based on a real story that happened back in, I believe, 1980 it was, the 1980 Pennsylvania Lottery Scandal, which basically what happened was all the balls in the three machines, except those numbered four and six, were weighted, meaning that the drawing was almost sure to be a combination of those three digits. The scheme was successful in that 666 was drawn on April 24th, 1980. However, the unusual betting patterns altered authorities to the crime. The chief conspirators were sent to prison, and most of the fraudulent acquired winnings were never paid out. So they basically took that idea here. They got the writer, uh, Adam Resnick, who did... Um, he worked on Late Night with David Letterman, and he also wrote Cabin Boy with Chris Elliott and worked on that sh the show he did with him, Get a Life. Uh, so there was a good writer involved in here, and a good cast as well. I mean, John Travolta, uh, Lisa Kudrow, Tim Roth, Ed O'Neill, Michael Rappaport, Bill Pullman, um, Michael Moore in a very weird, rare, you know, acting performance from him. I mean, you know Michael Moore, of course, from his documentaries, but it's really weird to see him take on a, an acting role in this and. I mean, to his credit, he's not bad in here, but honestly, the movie in general is kind of just, it kind of reminds me a little bit of The Little Vampire. I mean, it's a movie that's been hailed as one of the biggest box office bonds of all time. It was like a $63 million budgeted film and only bought in $11 million in total. So yeah, this thing kind of crashed and burned, but it's not that it's a bad movie per se, and like... Especially after what John Travolta had to go with in the middle of the summer with Battlefield Earth. I would rather take this over Battlefield Earth any day of the week. I mean, he's actually trying in here. He has some funny moments in here. The ideas in here 
are pretty funny. Like, I like the idea that he's so popular that he has his own table at Denny's. Like, of all the places you can go to, why would you want your own table at Denny? He's like, I mean, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's because I haven't had Denny's in a while and probably don't really want to have Denny's in a, after a while. It's because I don't remember. I, last I remember, Denny's does not usually is not usually the best place to go to when it comes to like real, food, really good food, and unless they're, you're there late at night, of course, Denny's is always open twenty four hours a day. But um, I'm going off topic here altogether. But this is Nora Ephron who directed this movie. Uh, she also uh, she this was coming after her success with You've Got Mail and uh, Michael and kind of the beginnings of her. Not really her downfall, but she wasn't making as many movies as she was in the 1990s. Like, she made, like, five movies in the 90s, and about maybe two, three of them were pretty good. Sleepless in Seattle, You've Got Mail. Michael was, eh. And then in the 2000s, she didn't really direct a whole lot, but she the three movies she made, um, this is probably the weakest one, uh, Bewitched, which I know a lot of people really did not like was actually not that bad, and Julia and Julia was really, really good that came out at the end of the year. I think that was one of my favorite movies that came out that year in 2009. But this movie isn't that bad. I mean, it's not that great either, but one of the worst movies of the year? I'm not gonna go that far. I mean, the writing overall is okay for what it is. The direction's not too bad. I, everybody's trying their best here, but you can kind of figure out right away where the story is going to go, and I think that really is the stumbling point for the film, is that it's very predictable. It's not really all that funny. Some of the lines in here are not really all that great. Um, excuse me. Anyway, sorry about that. But, um, yeah, it has some good ideas to it. It's an interesting story that they put together here, but I don't know if this is the right path they really should have taken with it. I feel like you should have gone much darker, Either go much darker or do something like kind of like an Ocean's Eleven type of movie that we get the year before, the year after this. Like, make it a bit, make it a really good, smart, sophisticated heist comedy. I mean, Ocean's Eleven worked so well, but then again, you had somebody like Steven Soderbergh working on that one, and this, this one doesn't really take those levels that I think it really should have taken. There's a lot of good talent in the cast, but um, just not enough execution there. Not really a whole lot of clever ideas or good storylines in general to really make it work. And you do kind of expect a whole lot more from it, especially with the talent on board here. But like I said, this totally beats the crap out of Battlefield Earth. I would rather watch this again any day of the week. And and for that, I gotta give it a little bit of an extra point here. Not a good movie, but not a bad movie either. Kind of a mixed bag thought on Lucky Numbers, honestly. And so on that note, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies. We'll jump into November on the next episode with two movies, including Charlie's Angels and also Will Smith and Matt Damon in The Legend of Bagger Vance. Uh, we'll take a look at those movies next time. Uh, but until then, thank you so much for watching. And if you want to see more videos like this, please hit the playlist on the next page. Check out the previous episode. And also, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this on this channel. So with that said, I am off. I will see you guys next time. And until then, as always, take care.